All right, hello everybody, welcome back. We are on the next installment of our discussion of character, conflict, and plot. So, in this sec section of this video, I just want to discuss and describe how to sort of begin the process of extracting these things from a short story. So, I'm not going to go into the story in tremendous detail because there's a lot going on in the story, and the story that I'm referring to is, of course, The Cask of Amontillado, by Edgar Allan Poe. So I'm not going to, again, go into too much detail, too much depth, because that's not the purpose here, but my purpose here is to sort of model a little bit of how to approach the story and, as I said, select out the key parts of the story as it relates to what we've talked about already. Characters, conflict, and plot. So we will discuss a little bit about dramatic irony as we go, which we discussed in uh, part one of this segment. So we're going to look at the cask of Amontillado. And I'm going to read just a little bit of the story in different sections of the story, just to give you an idea of how to go about analyzing out these characters' conflicts and how it drives the plot. <clears throat> so just to begin with the who of the story, we talk about the main character, the protagonist, is of course, in this case, Montresor. So, there are other characters in the story that we have to recognize and identify, and these are listed over here. One of the other characters is a character by the name of Fortunato, who is in fact Montresor's um, considered enemy. There is another character by the name of Lucchese. He is a wine merchant, and this, of course, Amontillado refers to a very expensive and rare form of Spanish wine, and Montresor and Fortunato are connoisseurs of wine and fine wines in general. So, as we get into the description of the action of the story, this has a great bearing on how um, Fortunato falls into Montresor's trap. So, Lucchese is mentioned in the story several times, but we never actually see him. We never actually have a complete description of <coughs> his character. He's only used as a form of bait for Fortunato. But then there is another character who we never see and have no, no description of whatsoever, this character who is referred to only as you. All right, so <clears throat> I'm going to read part of the opening paragraph of the story, and then we'll talk about what is happening. All right, so again, the cask of Amontillado is the story, and it begins in this way. It says, and this is Montresor speaking. This is a first-person narration. Montresor is the narrator of this story, and this is his relation of how he goes about um, getting his revenge on Fortunato. So it begins. The thousand injuries of Fortunato I had borne as best I could. But when he ventured upon insult, I vowed revenge. You, who so well know the nature of my soul, will not suppose, however, that I gave utterance to a threat. At length I would be avenged. This was a point definitely settled. But the very definitiveness with which it was resolved precluded the idea of risk. I must not only punish, but punish with impunity. A wrong is unredressed when retribution overtakes its redresser. It is equally unredressed when the avenger fails to make himself felt to such as him who has done the wrong. Now, just from that opening, we have some key pieces of information that we have to identify in terms of the characters and the conflict. So right there in the in introduction to the story, the exposition as we describe, the character of Fortunato is introduced as well as this you, this sort of mysterious character referred to as you is also mentioned. So right off the bat, what does Poe do? He gives us a couple of the central characters. He gives us Fortunato and he gives us this mysterious you character. But he also does something else which is very important. He identifies the mission of the protagonist, Montresor. So if you think about some of the ideas we talked about in earlier segments, <clears throat> we have to figure out what is the main character's mission? What is his goal? What is his objective? Because the protagonist always wants something. He always wants to do something to achieve some goal, to achieve some objective. And in this case, I call it a mission. So what is his mission? 
His mission is to kill Fortunato. Okay? So in other words, why does he want to kill Fortunato? This is also given to us in the very first paragraph of the story. Why does he want to kill Fortunato? For revenge. So we mentioned yesterday in the video that revenge is a very powerful motivating factor in many stories. People who want revenge feel that they have been wronged to an extreme degree and they want to get back at the person who wronged them in such a way that they will feel satisfied and avenged for whatever happened to them. Now, in this case, revenge means to kill. All right? He definitely, absolutely wants to kill Fortunato. But why? Why is he out for revenge? In this case, we have no real clear idea about why he wants to kill Fortunato. The two words that he mentions in the opening paragraph are injury and insult. So the problem is that we don't have any definition of what these things refer to and what are the differences between them. So apparently the injury, whatever it was, or the multiple injuries, because he mentions the word thousand injuries, that is not significant enough of a factor. So this does not cause the revenge or the desire for revenge. Whatever those injuries were, they were bearable, they were tolerable. But for some reason, Montessori makes this distinction between injury and insult, and insult somehow is not tolerable. It is not something that he can bear the burden of. So whatever that insult is, we never find out in the story. Poe deliberately leaves it up to us to sort of wonder and speculate about it. But it's never defined specifically in the story. So again, <clears throat> this insult must have been severe enough in Montresor's mind to think, you know what, I can't tolerate Fortunato's existence anymore. I'm going to have to get rid of him. So this drives the revenge, whatever this mysterious insult was, is the reason why he wants to get the revenge and kill Fortunato. Now, also in the opening paragraph, we have two very important things that are established in terms of Montresor's goals in wanting to kill Fortunato. That's one. He establishes the injury versus insult thing and the need for revenge. But he also establishes his goals. His ultimate goals are twofold. So the first thing is, his goal is to get away with it. Right, so all this thing about the redresser and the unredressed and all this kind of language may be a little bit difficult for some to figure out, but what he's talking about is his prime motivation is this insult, but his ultimate objective is, number one, to get away with the, with the crime. He does not want to get captured or arrested or executed for this crime. So that's part of his mission, is to kill, yes, but to get away with it, for sure. So ultimately, he's trying to orchestrate what would be considered a perfect crime. So that he would kill Fortunato and destroy Fortunato in such a way that he would never be attached to the crime. And then his second goal, his second objective, is to identify himself as revenger to Fortunato. So, that part is easy enough, because at the end of the story, that's exactly what he does. He reveals the fact that he's the one carrying out this execution, this cold-blooded, calculated execution. So he does identify himself as a revenger to Fortunato. But what he doesn't do is he doesn't tell Fortunato the reason why he's killing him. And Fortunato asks him at one point in the story, why? For the love of God, why? Why are you doing this to me? What did I do to deserve this? horrible fate and Fortunato is is in a state of distress extreme distress at this point and he's he knows what's about to happen but he can't figure out why it's happening because all the way through the story Montresor has played very friendly to Fortunato and pretended to be you know someone who has his best interests in mind but all the time it's all been a farce set up to deceive Fortunato into thinking certain thing one way and then another thing is sprung upon him at the last moment. 
But Montresor never gives Fortunato the satisfaction, at least the very small satisfaction, of knowing why he's taking this revenge and why he's leaving Montresor, is leaving Fortunato to die in such a horrible way. So that even small speck of knowledge which would possibly give Fortunato some final you know, realization, okay, well, maybe I do deserve this after all. No, it's denied him. So that is something, at least, he does identify himself as a revenger, but he does not identify why he's taking the revenge, even to Fortunato. So as part of the rising action here in the story, we're not going to go through the whole story, you know, <clears throat> word for word, but as part of the rising action, this is where Montresor is leading Fortunato down into the catacombs, down below his house, down in the wine cellar, so that Fortunato is of the impression that this rare and expensive wine, this Amontillado, is waiting for him at the bottom of this sort of vault underneath uh, the city. So Montresor leads him down, 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 all the way under the riverbed and way down under the <clears throat> streets of the city. And <coughs> Fortunato is drunk at the time because during this season, and this is part of where the setting comes into play, during the season of the story there's the carnival going on where many people are in costumes of course and Fortunato's costume is that of a court jester. Um, if you look at a pack of playing cards and you pull out the joker, his um, clothing is described as having striped clothing and a hat which is cone shaped and at the top of the hat there is a, a set of bells. So if you look at the picture or the illustration of the Joker from a typical deck of cards, you'll get an idea of somewhat what Fortunato is dressed like. So he's dressed as a clown, basically, a fool, and a Joker. So this is, of course, um, an example of how Poe uses irony in the story. Because Fortunato is supposed to be this highly respectable man, and Montresor even says that he's a man to be respected and somewhat even feared. So he does have some standing and some authority in the society, but he's dressed as a fool. And through the course of the story, obviously, he's made a complete uh, fool out of. So through the rising action, this is where Fortunato is being led by the nose, so to speak, all the way down to the catacombs until they reach this small area under the vaults and this is where, in this small cutout niche, it's pitch black, and Montresor says, okay, go right through there, and the Amontillado is right in there. All right? Now, all the way down, one other thing which is important to know is that Montresor has been giving Fortunato wine all the time, more wine, more wine, more wine, to keep him drunk, so that he's confused, right? He can't judge things properly. And again, it's his pride that it's being led to this Amontillado because Montresor said, oh, I'm not sure if it's the real thing. I need an expert to verify that this is actual Amontillado and not some other cheap imitation wine. So Montresor plays upon Fortunato's vanity as a sort of connoisseur of fine wines as a means to bait the trap. And he uses the name of Lucchese, who is another wine merchant in the town, to further goad Fortunato into thinking that he is the only one who is expert enough to figure out if this is real Amontillado or not. So whenever Montresor says, oh, you know what, I'm going to go ask Lucchese, I see you're busy, I don't want to disturb you, Fortunato's like, no, 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 Lucchese, he's an idiot, I'm the only one in town, you need me, I'm going down with you, I don't care what you say. So eventually he goes down, all the way down, and he reaches this part of the catacombs, and <clears throat> Montresor says, okay, go in there, the Amatiotto's in there waiting for you. And then when Montresor is standing outside, Fortunato goes into this area, he is confronted by a blank wall. And he has no idea what's going on. There's just this blank wall in front of him, and then Montresor chains him up, throws a chain around him, chains him to the wall because there are two iron rings on the wall, and he chains him up, and Fortunato's trapped. And then, what does Montresor do? He starts unwrapping and unveiling all these building stones and mortar and cement, and he starts building up the wall level by level 
until he reaches a certain height. And Fortunato is all the time trying to figure out what's going on. And eventually he realizes that this is the end for him. So the climax of the story comes into effect when Fortunato is chained to the wall. And this is where the conflict is really decided. Now, just to backtrack a little bit, we only have two major characters in the story. Montresor is one, Fortunato is the other. So who is the antagonist? Well, when I've taught this story in school, many times people say, oh, if Montresor is the protagonist, then Fortunato has to be the antagonist. But we have to be a little bit careful. Fortunato is not the antagonist in the story. And why is that the case? So, who is the real antagonist? Fortunato is not an antagonist because by definition, as we have seen, an antagonist is someone who is working against the protagonist. And the protagonist is struggling against the antagonist. It is my interpretation that there is no point in the story where Fortunato is causing any resistance or any kind of problem or any kind of obstacle that the main character, Montresor, has to overcome. Fortunato is not providing any kind of, you know, pushback against Montresor. He's, in fact, driving Montresor, let's go down, let's go down, let's go down, just because he wants to be the one to identify this Amatiado. So, <clears throat> I cannot consider Fortunato an antagonist, because he's not causing any kind of resistance or problem for Montresor's plan. In fact, he's leading his, his, himself into his own grave, basically. So, he's a willing participant and not someone who's opposing the protagonist. So we have to look somewhere else for the protagonist. We'll get back to that in a minute. So the climax refers to the point in the story where the conflict is decided. Well, if you consider the point where Fortunato is chained, that's the end for him. And then the falling action would be, as I said here, Fortunato's realization. He realizes that he's doomed. He's not going to escape. He tries to cajole his way out of it. He tries to, you know, oh, this is a sick joke, but great, you know, practical joke. But then he realizes Montresor is not joking. So all the time Montresor is building up these levels of the bricks to seal him in for his final eternal rest. So Fortunato's realizations after he's chained to the wall, really brings us down to the final point. So, let me just read for you the end of the story, as it is well known. <clears throat> so, he says to Fortunato, But it is not getting late. Will they not be waiting for us at the Palazzo, the Lady Fortunato and the rest? Let us be gone. Yes, I said. Let us be gone. For the love of God, Montresor. Yes, I said, for the love of God. But to these words, I hearkened in vain for a reply. I grew impatient. I called aloud. Fortunato. No answer. I called again. Fortunato. No answer still. I thrust a torch through the remaining aperture and let it fall within. There came forth in return only a jingling of the bells. My heart grew sick on account of the dampness of the catacombs. I hastened to make an end of my labor. I forced the last stone into its position. I plastered it up. Against the new masonry, I re-erected the old rampart of bones. For the half of a century, no mortal has disturbed them. So, Fortunato is sealed up, chained up, and left to die. But he never finds out why Montresor is taking this revenge. Now, getting back to dramatic irony just quickly. And I should mention also, there is another character mentioned in that last paragraph who is mentioned only by name. We never see that character either. And that is Lady Fortunato. So Lady Fortunato, we have to assume, is Fortunato's wife. And Fortunato does say that the Lady Fortunato is waiting for him back at the Palazzo or back at his residence. So it is possible that, you know, if Fortunato disappears off the face of the earth, people are going to notice. And again, he's described as a well-respected and, and uh, high member of society. So Lady Fortunato could, in fact, 
you know, notice his disappearance, obviously, and then call in question who, you know, caused his disappearance. So, in any case, it's a risk for Montresor, the fact that Lady Fortunata would be waiting and wondering where her husband is. So, getting back to the original point, number one, dramatic irony. We know from the beginning of the story, because Montresor tells us he's out for revenge, he's going to kill Fortunato. We know this, the whole time we know this, from the very beginning. But through the course of the story, Fortunato has no clue what's coming. He has no clue what's happening. So through the course of the story, he's led further and further down into the depths, and eventually, finally at the end, he has some realization of what's going on. He knows he's going to be left to die, but he has no idea why. So, the dramatic irony comes into effect in that case, in that way. Now, the final resolution, 50 years later, half a century, as he says, he tells us nobody has disturbed Fortunato's bones. Okay? So, the ultimate question is, why in the world would Montresor, after 50 years, suddenly feel the need to confess this crime. So I've read various commentaries and various you know, interpretations of this uh, ending of this story. And some people have said, well, he must feel guilty because he killed Fortunato. Well, that in a way really doesn't hold water because if the burden of guilt was so unbearable for him, you know, he seemed to have stood it pretty well for 50 years. And if you're walking around for 50 years carrying a burden of guilt, which is so oppressive and, um, you know, weighing you down to a point where you feel you need to confess it, well, why didn't you do it earlier? Okay? So 50 years is a hell of a lot of time to wait to go confess a crime that you got away with. And remember, his first goal was to get away with the crime. Right? Did he accomplish his goal? Yes, he accomplished the goal. He got away with the crime. For 50 years, he's got away with the crime. So he accomplished his mission. And did he identify himself to Fortunato as his revenger? Yes, he did. So he accomplished both these goals. So then why in the world would he, after 50 years of getting away with this crime, obviously he has no reason to confess, because he has in fact committed the perfect crime. Nobody's ever found Fortunato. He's still down there in the catacombs. Nobody's ever found him. Nobody's ever attached Montresor's name to his disappearance. So for 50 years, he's gotten away with the perfect crime. So then why is he confessing the crime? Because the whole story is his confession. So this makes no sense from a logical point of view. And some other people have said, well, maybe it's a deathbed confession. You know, he wants to confess to this crime before he dies. Well, again, if we think about it, you know, reasonably, if Montresor was in his 30s when he committed this crime, obviously 50 years would be, he would now be in his 80s. So that makes sense. I mean, it could be close to the end of his life. But there's no, you know, information that Poe gives us that he's about to die. We have to speculate about that. Now, we do have this mysterious you character mentioned at the beginning of the story. So we could say, well, he's confessing it to this person, whoever he's referring to as you. But again, okay, who is the you? We are never told. Who does this you refer to? Is it the police? We don't know. Is it his relative? Is it his, you know, wife? We have no idea. So... This is not something that we can definitively say is going to be solved. Why is he making this confession? But we can say one thing. So getting back to the word antagonist. So in the antagonist, who is the antagonist in the story? We have to assume then that Montresor is the antagonist. Because Montresor would be working against himself. If he's gotten away with a crime for 50 years, and that was his original objective, was to get away with the crime, and he succeeded, and now he's confessing his crime. Well, we know from these times that anybody who commits a murder is going to be executed for that murder. So whether he's 50 years old, or 60 years old, or 70 years old, or 80, he's going to get executed for the crime, if he confesses. And this whole story is his confession. So in this case, the protagonist and the antagonist both have to be the same person. So therefore, we must assume that this is a case of character 
verses 7. Because Montresor is working against himself. He's working against his own best interests. He's confessing this crime to someone, whoever this you is, he's confessing the crime to that person, and by extension, he's confessing it to the reader. So he's working against himself. He's condemning himself. He's setting himself up for execution. And that was not his original purpose. So he's working against his original purpose. He's already succeeded with that purpose. Why is he now objectively subjective and getting himself executed for that crime? Makes no sense. So therefore, number one, he must be working against himself, so that's character versus self, and he must be mentally unbalanced. He must be mentally unstable. Enough insane, perhaps, to condemn himself to execution. So, these are the basic points of the story. If you want to go through the story in more detail, I fully recommend reading The Cask of Amontillado. It's only about 10 pages long, if that. And it is a very, very uh, well-known story and highly anthologized around uh, America in different textbooks for English language arts classes. So, hopefully this was helpful as a way to model how to pull out the information, the key pieces of detail, from a short story such as this one. There's a lot more going on in the story even though we covered the basics of it, the foundations of it. I highly recommend that people follow up and read the story. So that's all for now. Next time we'll get into a new topic and we'll do some more descriptions of short stories and how to pull information out of short stories as to how to approach an analytical essay for example. Alright so We'll see you again very soon. Thank you for watching.